everyone to our fabulous taste talks at Kendall College at National Lewis University. I'm Christine Duke. I'm the continuing education manager at Kendall College. And we're very excited to have a fabulous culinary taste talk for you today. Uh, Saruthi Swaminathan is going to be sharing with us a Jamaican squash soup. So it's definitely soup season. It may not exactly feel like soup weather out there today, but it's Jamaican. So thus it kind of fits, doesn't it? Um, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. 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 So um, very excited to uh, learn about this soup. Again, if you would like the recipe for today's soup, please email me at taste at nl.edu and I'd be very happy to get that to you. But Sruthi, if you would like to take it away. Okay, hi guys. Thanks everyone for joining. There's so many of my family members and friends that are here. I'm so happy to see all of you. Um, so to, yeah, so like Christine said, what I'm gonna be showing today is a Jamaican squash soup. The way that I came up or how I thought of this recipe is last year around Thanksgiving time. So around this time, actually, my neighbor across the hall was hosting a Friendsgiving. So she wanted people to come over and she had a theme of like a Caribbean Jamaican sort of theme and it was a potluck. So she wanted everyone to, to bring something in. And I don't think I'd made anything Jamaican or at least that I could identify as Jamaican before. And so I'm thinking, okay, what, what am I going to make? And it was cold and it was, I had some jerk seasoning. So I figured why not make some Jamaican squash soup? And there were so many different kinds of squashes available. It was, it just seemed like the perfect thing to make. So that's what I'm gonna be showing you today. Um, before we actually get into the recipe and the ingredients, I wanna let you know a little bit about the background of this. And I took some notes as I told Christine. Um, so really Jamaican or Caribbean cuisine is a nice mix of cuisines from all over the world, which is really a reflection or an indication of all the people that have settled there over the generations. And it's, it, it's usually a mix of African, Portuguese, Indian, and Middle Eastern cuisines, and it has those influences, but it has some that are, some influences that are really um, core Jamaican, I guess you could call it. And um, a lot of times in Jamaican or Middle Eastern, or Jamaican or Caribbean cuisine, meats and seafoods are very common, um, and they can be meat and seafood heavy, as you can as you can imagine, because the proximity to the waters and things like that. But there's also a big kind of vegetarian segment there, um, coming from a little bit of the Rastafarian influences, where uh, they're all about eating local, eating natural, eating organic. And many Rastafarians actually, and I had to look this up on Wikipedia, I don't just know this by myself, um, are vegetarian or vegan. And I didn't even know this last year when I first made this soup. So, the soup we're going to make today is, I would call it relatively healthy. It's filled with a bunch of veggies. Um, there's also some roasted squash that's going to go into it that I've already started up in the end that I'll talk about. And some of the main flavors in it are of allspice. So what allspice is, is I used to think until last year that allspice was just all spices mixed together. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Christine, I, can't, I, I really used to just think it was all spices mixed together. So when I couldn't find all spice at the grocery store, I'd be like, oh yeah, let me just get some like cumin, coriander, turmeric, da, da, da. but I realized I was just picking all Indian spices and that is not what all spice is. All spice is actually a berry and it has different flavors um, reminiscent of these other spices, which is why it's called allspice. It's not just a blend of the other spices together, although there's nothing wrong with that. Um, another flavor that's kind of common in these cuisines is uh, scotch bonnet pepper. And it's called that because of, I think the scotch bonnet is like a type of hat and um, the pepper kind of resembles the shape of that hat. And that's why it's called that. But something that's very similar in both appearance and in flavor profile is the habanero. It's the habanero pepper. And I have tried these before. Uh, I would say they're, I mean, I thought my description was they're way spicier than jalapenos. So it was surprising to me that I'm only adding one to this recipe. I never add one chili to anything. It kind of feels embarrassing to just add one chili. I mean, I like need spice to be able to taste something. But I looked up and apparently 
the habanero pepper, the scotch bonnet pepper, is about 20 times as spicy as the jalapeno, according to some the official. Sco it's the Scoville units. It has yes, a way higher right. Scoville yeah. unit rating than the jalapeno does. Yeah, and it was about 20 times hotter. So I figured I would just stick to one um, and do that. And the thing, oh, is she showing some of those peppers? She's showing some peppers, <laughs> showing some, um, peppers there, yeah. So the thing with these peppers is, yes, they're very, they pack a lot of heat, but the nice thing about them is they also, the minute you put them on your tongue, have a little bit of a fruity flavor almost um, and a little bit sweet. I know it sounds strange to say that a habanero or a thing, something that's supposed to be spicy is sweet, but it does have that kind of um, under, not undertone, what would be the word for that? It's like that. It's like, it's like a um, the base uh, note. It's the secondary, it's the secondary flavoring. Yeah, so, so that's what I think gives kind of a more complex flavor to it versus just adding straight cayenne pepper, um, which I feel is just heat. You know, so anyway, that's one of the other ingredients. And other than that, we're also going to include some other elements of maybe Caribbean Indian type cuisine, which is coconut milk. We're going to be using some herbs that you've maybe used in Italian cooking before um, that I'm not going to use in this. So let's get started. I have a, um, I have, I, I sent the recipe out to Christine for those of you that want to follow it. And so I'm just going to get started cooking. And if you have any questions, type them in. Okay. Yep. Please, if okay. anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat box and I will present them to Sruthi while she is cooking. So okay. do you have all of your ingredients all prepped and ready to go? All my ingredients, yes, thank you for the reminder. So I have them all here. All I'm doing now is I'm heating up a Dutch oven. Again, my mom gave another really good tip last time, which was don't use this burner because I'm standing right here and I could get burned, but I'll figure it out for next time. I'll <laughs> So what you can see is I have all the ingredients here. So what I have is a little bit of butter. Well, a little bit. It's gonna be a big pot. It's gonna be a big pot of soup. I have some, um, this is canola oil. I have um, carrots. It's about a cup, cup and a half of carrots. You'll see there's a mixture of kind of sliced carrots and also shredded carrots just because I had some left over. I like that variety though, adding into the texture of the soup. Having yeah, a difference. I mean, ultimately I am gonna be pureeing it. I have made this soup where I um, don't puree it at the end. And so you get all of the texture of uh, the vegetables, but here I'm gonna be pureeing it, but you're right, it adds to the nice texture of it. Usually I try to cut things about the same size and shapes that they cook at the same time. Mm -hmm. I also have about half a cup of celery. I have about, like three large garlic cloves. I love garlic. So even though there is garlic in the Jamaican jerk seasoning that I put in the squash, um, I just added, and in the allspice, I've just added more garlic anyway. And then I have um, about two scallions or green onions diced. I have a couple tablespoons of parsley. This is fresh parsley. You can also use um, dried parsley, but it's a little bit less. The exact amount will be in the recipe. And then here, I loved how this color turned out. Um, I have about two teaspoons of curry powder, which you can buy. You could really find curry powder anywhere now. Um, mm -hmm. Indian store usually is where I get it, but you can get it at the at Whole Foods, at Mariano's, at Kroger, where, wherever you go, you could find it. And this is a teaspoon of um, allspice, just what I talked about before. And then we also have some fresh thyme and some fresh bay leaves, or dried bay leaves, I guess, or whole. I have some coconut milk and I have some vegetable broth. Now, if you're not vegetarian and you wanna use um, chicken broth or something, you can definitely do that. And the thing that you're not seeing now, which you will in a little bit, which I started ahead of time, is in the oven, I've cut up one whole uh, butternut squash. It was about two and a half to three pounds, the whole squash was, and I peeled it. And then I cut it up, I um, took out the little veins and seeds and stuff inside. And I cut it up into kind of little cubes and I tossed it in canola oil and Jamaican jerk seasoning. So let me show you a little bit. This, I just got this at Whole Foods today actually, cause I was out. So it just says dry Jamaican, um, hot Jamaican dry jerk rub. And 
this is again a mixture of garlic, of onion. It has salt in it, so be careful about how much salt you add early on. Um, but it's a nice kind of different kind of flavor than what I'm used to cooking in Indian cuisine at least. So one thing to note is when you toss them with the butternut squash, I like the spices to be a little more ground. So I use this really small mortar and pestle I have to grind them up a little more because the pieces were big. But so all it is is olive oil, salt, and the Jamaican jerk seasoning, or sorry, not olive oil, canola oil, tossed it and put it in a preheated 400 degree oven. It's gonna cook in there for a total of 40 minutes. And at the halfway point, I like to toss it and kind of flip the tray that everything cooks evenly. And I even switched the where each tray was because it's on two trays because I don't want to kind of crowd them. Um, and that should be done in about 10, 15 minutes. You'll hear the alarm and I'll take it out. So that's going to be one of the last steps of our thing. All right, enough talking. Let's get started. All right, so yeah. here's pot. Let me show you. You can see that? Yeah. Okay. All right, you may not be able to see me for now, but that's okay. So now, so first thing we're gonna do is add some um, canola oil. And really, it would be nice to just make this with butter, but butter tends to burn pretty easily. So I like to add it with a little bit of oil. Make sure the pot is not too, too hot. Um, you're not really looking for that brown butter look or taste right now. Um, but if you like that, you could do it, but butter just burns really quickly. And this butter I've had sitting out for a little while, so it's nice and gooey. That's about two to two and a half tablespoons of butter. Why do you recommend canola oil instead of olive oil or a different kind of oil? Yeah, that's a good question. So I love olive oil. I use it in almost any, anything, but olive oil has a flavor. And here the flavors that I want to stand out are the flavors of the jerk seasoning and of the vegetables and of the squash. Um, when I put in the olive oil, it still tastes good, but I find that it just imparts a different kind of flavor to it based on the kind of olive oil, which can sometimes be a little more fruity. It can sometimes be a little more peppery. And here I just want to keep the flavor profile a little more in um, the flavors of the vegetables and the Jamaican spices. Okay, so this is not too hot, which is good. You guys see that? Yeah, okay. And then once that heats up, we are going to add some onions to it, which I was <laughs> in a rush cutting it the last minute. Okay. And usually when I add the onions, I like to add just a little piece in first to see if it sizzles right away. You'll notice that didn't sizzle. I don't know if you could hear that, but I don't want that because if I add the onions in here now, they're just gonna absorb all of the oil and not kind of start cooking right away. I feel like they're just getting engorged with oil, which is not what I want for them. So I'm gonna turn the heat up a little bit. The first thing that'll go in there is the onions. So I would recommend if you're doing this, always start the squash first, because uh, that's what takes a while. And then you wanna remember to flip it and toss it and things like that. Um, another thing I would say is, I used to hate cutting any kind of squash. Uh, because it's just really hard. Like no matter how yeah. hard your knives are, it, and I'm kind of a clumsy person anyway. And so it's tough when you're using a sharp implement and things aren't cutting easily. So what I did this time is I kind of stabbed the butternut squash with a fork a bunch of times all around on the skin and I microwaved it for six minutes just on a plate. And so what that did is it softened it up just enough where the weight of the knife was enough to cut through it with not too much difficulty. So always mm -hmm. start that. All right, you can see now. That so how, piece how, much, how much onion are you putting in here? This is about um, one and a half-ish um, of a medium-sized onion. I think in the recipe I put one onion, but that's a large onion and this is a little smaller. So I'm putting a little less. There's the noise we were looking for. Oh, you can hear it. That's yeah. Good. Okay, okay, good. Oh no, mom's gonna say I need to replace these cutting boards too. <laughs> okay. All right, I'll add it. To, I'll add it to the Black Friday list, mom. <laughs> um, okay, 
So I'm stirring it. You know what's interesting? Tell me if this happens to any of you guys. The smell of like onions and garlic and yes, Chitra, that you can use red onion. In fact, I love red onion in this. I just happen to have yellow. Um, but does this happen to you guys where you like, you're about to make something, it's pretty involved, it has a lot of stuff, but you just add the onions and the garlic and then everyone in the house is like, oh my God, what are you making? Yeah. That's it. And all there is is onion and garlic. And then you're like, why do I try so hard to make all these other things if this is all, this is all it takes? Oh, there's a little peel in there. Yeah, the onion and garlic, there's just nothing like coming coming home and someone's been cooking that smell, you know, cooking with that and that smell when you walk in the house and such. Yeah. And, and you know, I know some people who um, in the fall especially, will just like put in a little oil and a couple cinnamon sticks and cloves just as in, in lieu of a candle. Just mm -hmm. put in kind of that so the house smells like cinnamon and cloves and whatever and not actually cooking anything. So, okay. So I'm just gonna saute this a little bit for now. I want them to soften. I always like to uh -oh, cook the onions through a little bit before adding the garlic because the garlic tends to burn pretty quickly. Um, I don't want burnt garlic in this, so I'm gonna toss this away. And once they soften a little, we'll go on with the other veggies. And the next thing I'm gonna be adding in there is the green onions and the garlic together. Does anyone have any questions so far? No, we're doing great. Okay. Oh. Uh, yeah, we see all the steam coming right now. That looks awesome. Yeah, it's getting... I love your new Dutch oven. That's such a great color. Oh, thank you. So I've actually had this, Christine, for a while. Ah. But this is an eight quart one. I think it's like the, what's this? It's like the Martha Stewart brand or something. Um, and it's an eight quart one, but it's huge. So the one I always used was my six quart red one that you saw. Mm -hmm. For um, making a soup a bigger pot just makes life easier too. Yeah. I think the main thing is just keeping them clean. So I'm going to get another Dutch oven over Black Friday, but I think it's just, I tend to, things are um, crusted on. I love people's suggestions on what they do if this happens. I just get very lazy to scrub the Dutch oven. So I just like put a little soap, put a little water and used to let it soak overnight, which I've heard is a big no-no. Like you have yeah. to kind of because it can rust and things like that. So if anyone has suggestions on how to keep pots stain free, I'm all for it. Although in my red Dutch oven's defense, it's been through nine years of like twice a week cooking. So I can't really- It's lots of love. Yeah. Okay, just little peels in here. All right, so this is getting pretty soft now. And I like this about the Dutch ovens too. They seem to heat pretty evenly. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm not finding that, you know, one part is getting way hotter or anything like that. Okay, so next we're going to add, I'm hearing that it already smells good. See what I mean? Oh, that's good. Yeah. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to add is the scallions and the garlic. This is usually the point at which, like, I take my phone out and waste a bunch of time trying to make a boomerang, you know, where you're like, yeah, I am familiar with getting slowed down by recording things for social media. <laughs> I know. Very, very familiar. I was trying to do that today and I was like, I haven't even put the squash in the oven. What am I doing? <laughs> this is this. Okay, here's the green onions. And so with green onions, sometimes what people will do is, you know how there's a white part, like the bulb part, and then the green part. People sometimes put the white part in first and then add the green part later uh, because the green part is more leafy and it cooks quicker, et cetera. And so, but I just added all of it together and I always add extra of the green part at the end if I, if I feel like it either for garnish or additional flavor. Okay, and then we're gonna add garlic. Fabulous. And then we got a recommendation on cleaning in the Dutch ovens. Okay. So soaking it in white vinegar and a little baking soda to get the stain out. Yes, actually, I have a feeling my aunt recommended that because her daughter-in-law texted me the same thing. Uh -huh. when I asked her. <laughs> They're tag teaming advice to you. <laughs> yes, I asked Nicola, I said, what do I do with my Dutch oven? And she said the same thing. 
And apparently you can soak them in bleach water too, but I don't know. I didn't try that. I think my husband may have done that, but don't quote me on it. Okay. All right. So in the recipe, you'll see that I said um, soak or not soak, um, add the garlic until it's fragrant. The thing is with garlic, it's fragrant almost immediately, at least mm -hmm. to me. I feel like I have the nose of a bloodhound sometimes, but I can smell it. So I'm gonna start adding the other stuff. Next, you wanna add um, carrot. I'm gonna put that in. Celery. And the habanero. I'm so tempted to add another one, but I'm going to try this with just don't, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah. Okay. And folks, if you're if you're making this, uh, if you're doing this recipe for yourself at home, and you're not very much a person who appreciates and loves and embraces spice. Yeah. Hold that. Always scale like with with a pepper like that. Like I said, it it's very very high on the Scoville units. It's a very very high impact pepper. Um, mm -hmm. Try start with a quarter, okay? Give it a try with that first, and then build build up if if you find that you can take it. Other words, be ready to add um, add some garnishes later on, like maybe some sour cream or something to kind of mute down that heat. That yeah. Good. From it. And another here, you guys can see that this is just going to cook away for a little bit. I might even cover it for a couple of minutes until, is that clear? Yep. I might even cover it for a couple of minutes just so it has, because if it's open, my temptation is just to keep stirring it and that way things are not cooking. So I'm going to turn the heat down just a little bit. I'm going to cover this thing. Okay. Um, yeah, another thing that you can actually do is, of course, you can like remove the seeds and remove the webbing. Mm -hmm. That's not make it, give it, to have it be less heat. You can use less quantity. You can use the same quantity, but remove the webbing and the seeds. Another thing you can do is, um, I just lost my train of thought. There's, there's definitely, <laughs> there's definitely another thing you could do. Um, yeah, like removing the seeds in the veins, oh. that's where all, all a lot of the heat really lives within peppers. Yeah. So, and, and that works for any kind of pepper at all. If you remove the seeds and, and you remove the veins, that'll help um, reduce down the, the, the heat on it. Yeah, and a couple of the things I was gonna say is, if the soup you're making or the curry that you're making or um, whatever it is, is more of a cream base. So if you're gonna be adding like um, heavy cream or half and half or coconut milk or something like that, that does temper some of the heat. So mm -hmm. based on your preference or based on your tolerance of spice, I guess, you could adjust it based on that. And that really works, you know, and I don't, and another thing is if you don't puree it. So that's the thing to keep in mind. Like if you're gonna at the end, just take these things out, it's not gonna infuse as much with every spoon you have is not gonna have as much of that heat. So since I know I'm gonna be pureeing this, there's my marshal letter. Um, if I know I'm going to be pureeing it, then I especially want to be careful of how much heat I add. And the last thing I would add is if you, because this soup, we're not going to finish this in one day. So, yeah, we're not going to finish this in one day. But if, so that means if we're going to keep it in the refrigerator, the flavors just intensify over the next day. So if you add more salt, it's going to be more, even more salty. So I would recommend not overdoing it with salt or heat um the day of because I've definitely experienced that where something tastes a little less salty and it turns out I just haven't given it enough time to absorb um and then I add more salt and the next day it's kind of inedible because it's way too salty yeah so. we got I, I got someone sent me another um very important tip with spicy peppers as well don't rub your eyes after touching it yes make sure after you handle any kind of a spicy pepper or if you're nervous at all and not used to working with something with that kind of heat and stuff of course the oils all of that can trans can will go to your hands you touch your face you touch um you touch your mouth anything like that you can get that heat yes always work with gloves on that's a you good know? point i was just always work with yeah. gloves on if that's something that you're concerned about or you're if you're trying it out for the first time it's something new or even if you're experiencing you just want to make sure you don't get heat in your eyes 
Well, and I was just telling you before we started the session that I just cut up the, I'm using habanero because I didn't find scotch, scotch one. I'm using habanero, but I used it and I must have just accidentally touched one part of my face. I didn't even realize it and I could feel it. And it was just a, the tiniest bit. So yeah, respect the pepper. So definitely wash your hands, lots of soap and water as you should be anyways for sanitation reasons. So. Okay. And if you do, if you do try your soup and you know, you're not much of a spice person and it's way too spicy, get yourself a glass of milk. That's the thing that's going to help you the most with battling that heat in your mouth. Yep. Okay. This is coming along nicely. Um, you do want this to be pretty soft, but what we're also going to do to this is so far we've added the, the veggies, we've added, you know, garlic, onion, some butter, some oil green onions, carrot, and celery. But we haven't added any of the flavorings or like the spices yet. And by spices, I don't necessarily mean for heat, I just mean for flavor. So the next thing we're gonna do is make a little, let me move this this way. Okay, we're just gonna make a little well in the middle like that. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Like that. God, live TV. <laughs> okay, that's yep. good. You see that well? Yeah. Okay, so what we're gonna do in there is we're just gonna add a little bit of oil. And the reason for that is I'm gonna add the spices in now and these spices burn very quickly. And I don't want them to burn as soon as they hit the pan because then it just gets bitter and it's gonna ruin the taste of the whole soup. So. You remember these spices, allspice curry powder. I'm just gonna add that right in the center, swirl it around so it kind of releases some of its aromas and then gradually mix it into the rest of the veg. You see how dark that is? Then yeah, make it's such thin. a transformation. Mm -hmm. It's immediately gonna start smelling different too. And that's really an indication of how quickly these spices, as soon as they hit the heat, um, start to release those flavors. Okay, let's smell it. it smells good. Wish there was smell a vision with this. I know, I know. What's like, the status on that? It seems like I it don't know. they really need to get on that technology soon, I think. It would yeah. make a difference in all these Zoom calls. I know, it really will. Oh, those might be done. I'm not sure Okay, so I've added the spices in there. I don't want that to sit too, too long, just like that. I'm mm -hmm. gonna go ahead and add the next things in, which are fresh parsley. You can also use dried, just a different amount because it's more concentrated that way. We're also gonna add thyme. So I put three sprigs of thyme, but does it count if like each one has a couple on it? I don't know. But I'm gonna add these in, we'll take them out at the end Remember to take them out before you puree mm -hmm. it and get a bunch of stems in the soup. And also the bay leaf. And just mix this up. You don't want to break up the bay leaf because it's going to be tough to take out later on. It's crazy. You look at the bay leaf, it just looks like nothing, but it really adds so much flavor. Like I'm adding two of these. I, I've cooked a bay leaf so many times and I still don't believe that it's actually <laughs> anything. I know, bay leaf is the, it's one of those like really deceptive spices that you're like, does this really do anything? Yes, it does. It, it yeah. actually is an amazing thing. And it, it's just so strange because it's one of those things that you put in and then remove, so. Yeah. Hey guys, I'm not even gonna lie. This smells very, very good. <laughs> It smells so good. It smells warm. It smells like fall. It smells kind of cinnamony, even though we didn't add that. Maybe that's just part of the allspice. Maybe it's part of the herbs we just put in. I'm not sure, but it smells very good. A plus so far. Okay, so you can follow the steps until now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. All right. So one thing you will notice is there's little crusties on the I don't know if that's the official chef term, but uh, there's just stuff stuck to the bottom. Um, it's not quite burnt yet. It's just the spices. It's, do you see that? Mm -hmm. the the bottom. Um, that is actually all flavor. It has not gotten to the point where, come, come. 
It has not gotten to the point where it is burnt. It is just all flavor. So you don't want to lose that. And what I would say is this is the difference in making a soup like this in a Dutch oven or a stainless steel kind of heavy bottom pot versus making it in a um, nonstick pan. Because if you were to make it in a nonstick pan, things are not getting stuck to the bottom, which in one way is good because maybe it's harder to burn things. But on the other hand, the burning is really that, is it called a mallard reaction? You can help me out, Christine, that oh. reaction. Like, well, it's, like, it's, it's the, caramelized. the caramelization that's occurring, yeah. And it, yeah, and that kind of changes the flavor profile of it. So I'm happy that that's happening because with the next step, which is adding the broth, this is going to deglaze the pot. So this is going to pick up all those little bits off the bottom and incorporate them into the flavor of the soup. And this is about, this is, I'm gonna use one um, can of this, which is gonna be four cups. So when I add four cups of this, that I realized how big this Dutch oven is because I just added this whole thing. It's not even, it's not even coming up halfway because it's an eight quart. Um, Okay, and I can already feel that the little bits are scraping up off the bottom. They're gonna deepen the color of the soup and they're gonna deepen the flavor of the soup. Yeah. Okay. And the last thing I'm going to add in here, how are we doing on time? Um, well, we just, we're just gonna keep going. Okay, cool. So whatever um, we need to do in order to finish this recipe. Awesome. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna add in here is coconut milk. Um, we're going to add this in. It always looks a little thicker on the top. All the watery stuff is on the bottom. We're going to add this in. I think in the recipe I said about, about a cup. Um, I think this can is about a cup and a half. I'm going to add in about a cup, see how it is, and then decide if I want to add more, and then save a little bit for um, garnish at the very end, just to kind of make it, make it look nice. Okay, so let me Stir this up. This is always really satisfying to stir this up. And mm -hmm. Also, this is a perhaps strange side note, but did any of you read the story about um, coconut milk suppliers from Thailand? Did no, you read no. that? So no, I just read it. Tell me. Yeah, last weekend where, you know, the one brand is called like the Chowka or Chowko brand. It's a pretty common brand that's in a lot of um, grocery stores. And they did an investigation and found out that that brand, the way they make their coconut milk is by using monkeys that are basically like trained to go get coconuts. Coconut? There's a big, so Whole Foods is not going to sell them anymore. That's a very interesting choice of labor force. So. Yeah, so they're like chained and then they have to go up and get them. And they're getting like 300, 400 coconuts a day per monkey or something. And um, so there's a big petition now for all of the big suppliers to stop carrying mm -hmm. that brand of coconut milk. So it, I knew I was gonna tell that story. So then I like made sure it wasn't that brand because. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is on. I've mixed this coconut milk up really well. I'm going to. That, stir it around. And this will help with some of the heat that we talked about before as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then really you want to let this simmer for about 10 minutes, right? So it's just going to simmer in there because you want all the flavors to melt together. But one thing we can do in between is take out the squash. So just as a refresh, let me smell this really quick. Okay, I think it smells fine. Um, Okay, any questions so far on anything? No, I think we're doing good. Someone, I think someone started a question but didn't quite finish it yet, so. Oh, oops, can you guys see me? No, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. You are. Yeah, there. Oh, well, my dad's wearing a sweater. My son has the identical sweater. <laughs> Gonna be so happy about that. He has that same sweater. Um, 
Oh, can you get coconut milk from the Indian store? Yeah, he's got a picture of them. All right, so now I'm gonna take what, the squat. My dad? You, yeah, he's holding up this picture. He's so proud. <laughs> um, so someone okay. asked, can you get coconut milk from the Indian store? Shruti? Okay, so just as a recap, I'm gonna stand away from that. Um, close this. I'm just gonna we want to want that want to bring that up to a simmer so that's the veg spices coconut milk and the vegetable broth so we're just gonna bring that up to a simmer we had one question come in would you be able to get coconut milk from the Indian store oh I can't hear you Christine is that okay okay go ahead would you be able to get coconut milk from the Indian store you can get coconut milk there yeah. um I think you can get it almost everywhere now it's it's definitely something that's become a lot more accessible um yeah. absolutely at whole foods um mariano's yep. jewel even you probably have to go into um the the ethnic aisles in order to find something like like the coconut milk and jewel or but it's definitely also, more prevalent yeah you can also get it at aldi or you can get it online mm -hmm. um just look out for the brands, I guess. When I use coconut milk, I tend to use the regular version. I almost never use like the one third fat or, or something like that, but that's just personal preference because if there's a recipe that I'm adding coconut milk to, I know that I want it to have a certain texture and I want it to have a certain creaminess. So if I made that decision, then I want it to deliver <laughs> with the right kind of coconut milk. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, anything you try to make creamy really, um, I made a sauce the other day that was just like onion, garlic, pesto, and a little bit of half and half. And I think the recipe I'd looked at for general inspiration used like full cream, or um, what's it called, just like heavy cream or something. And there mm -hmm. it didn't make much of a difference to me, but with coconut milk, I like to go for the full fat um, coconut milk. Okay, so what I've taken out here, you guys can see that? Yeah. So what this is, is this is the butternut squash that I was telling you about earlier, which I put in the microwave to kind of soften a little bit, cut it up um, into cubes once it's softened, and then tossed it. And all I've tossed it in is this, the hot Jamaican dry jerk rub, and a little bit of salt, even though this has some salt in it. I didn't overdo it, but I know things like this and potato can usually take a little more salt. So I tossed it in those I put them on two trays because I did not want them all packed in one where they're going to steam instead of crisp up and I wanted them to crisp up and the reason I do this is I've made this soup both ways I made it just by adding the butternut squash in at this step so while everything is simmering, I probably shouldn't open this because it's gonna let some of the heat up but I put it in at this step and kind of had it simmer in that and I've done it roasted and I love the roasted version so much more. Mm -hmm. Is it a little more work? Yes. But the flavor that you get just from that roasting with the spices and then adding it um, is much, much better in my opinion. And what we're gonna do here is I've about half of it in each one. So once this pot comes to a simmer, um, I'm just gonna add one of these trays, so half of the butternut squash, so about a pound and a quarter, pound and a half to the soup and let it simmer in there and then use my immersion blender to puree it. So that's flavor kind of gets infused into the broth. And then I'm gonna use the rest of it almost as a garnish at the very end. So right before serving. So what you get is you get the flavor of the roasted squash and then you get the texture of the roasted squash from the whole pieces. And I think that combination works really nicely and gives kind of a different flavor than pureeing the whole thing all over. And I had someone add to you, and you did peel the squash before it was roasted and everything. I like peeled that. the squash, but if, but if anyone knows whether you can just cook and add it to, if anyone's made squash with soup without peeling, let me know, because I know peels of vegetables are actually good for you a lot of times, but I was kind of concerned about whether it would affect the um, texture because sometimes when you put peel in, it cooks at a different rate than the actual veg, the vegetable. 
Yeah, with squash, that's one that it's not very often that I actually like consume that portion of it even, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, so I, you know, I've, I guess if you're doing it, and the other thing I was thinking about now is especially for this, for this class, I'm not putting it in a Vitamix. Like I have a table, countertop under a Vitamix that has a much more powerful blade. And if I was doing that, perhaps I just give it a go, or, but I'm gonna use an immersion blender. So. so. Okay, any other questions? So, oh, that person was actually said she's used butterscotch with peel on before and was good. But um, definitely if you're doing it in a soup, since we are going to, it's going to be blended up and stuff, you might want, and, and it's going to, you're looking to have a very smooth style soup. Yeah. Definitely peeling the, the squash is a really, really great idea. So. Yeah. And, you know, I know in restaurants, I always used to wonder, like, why is it that I'm, spending all this time making soups that it never has the consistency of what it's like at rough. Oh. And then I realized it's because they either finish with a little knob of butter or a little bit of cream mm -hmm. and pass it through a strainer mm -hmm. or, a strainer or whatever. Like, and yeah, I never- it's been, it's been blended and chinois and reblended and- yeah butter chips have been added and soup really gets some serious treatment, serious treatment at restaurants. So definitely um, what you're going to be making today is a little more on the rustic side of the yeah. situation, even though it is going to be a blended soup. Yes. Okay. So I'm just going to taste this right now. So you'll see one side of it's kind of crispier, one side of it's not. Oh my God. Very good. I'm not gonna lie, that's gonna be great in the soup. Um, and it's kind of remarkable how much this shrunk. I feel like when I started cooking it, it just looked like it was taking up the whole pan and it's not anymore. So, okay, this thing's steaming a little bit. So let us check. Okay, look at that. Yeah. See what it's supposed to do. And I do find, again, I don't know the the food science behind this. So if anyone knows, please speak up. But I find that coconut milk doesn't curdle quite like regular milk does. It's probably different kind of proteins. I know there's mm -hmm. different kind of stuff, but that's why if I'm ever adding milk to something, sometimes I add milk to like temper the heat or something like that. I'll add it at the very end. Whereas with coconut milk, it's really nice to have it simmer in there and infuse the flavor into everything that's in the pot. Uh, the, an the animal fat and the pro and the plant plant fat, very mm -hmm. different situations, or vegetable fat, very different situations. So, all right. So what I'm gonna do? This worked out because the next step is to just add half of the squash into the soup. And it just so happens that half of the tray is half of the squash. So I'm just gonna put this in here. And use this to kind of scrape off. And you know, I, I've also read and heard that it's nice to roast things on the pan itself instead of using aluminum foil. Uh, just because the surface of the pan conducts heat differently than when it's coming through the foil. Mm -hmm. Then I'm always thinking about like additional cleanup, but you know, I want to try that because I'm always just scared, but then I don't really know this pan's several years old now, so <laughs> I might as well just try it, um, try it that way. Okay, so this is in here now. And remember the squash is already hot. You're not really looking for it to cook through anymore. Um, Oh, I see someone. Oh, Shadanti had a question. Can you use oh, yeah, pumpkin? pumpkin instead? You can. So I went into a little bit of a research mode on like squash versus pumpkin versus gourds versus the, like there are a, a lot of different varieties you can use. The type that I, because of my personal taste preference, would avoid are the types of squashes, which I think pumpkin is either is pumpkin a type of squash or a squash a type of pumpkin. It's one of those. I think, I think they're all, and I see, and I'm not sure if gourd and squash, if those words are interchangeable or not. So I think oh. that's, I think it might have something to do with that exact definition. So, oh. 
So, but, but you can, you can use, so I went to Whole Foods today to pick up, um, to pick up some more of the Jamaican rub and they had like 20 kinds of squash. And I already had a butternut squash. And I almost got one of those other kinds. The kind I probably wouldn't use is the sweeter varieties. So there's some that I think are sweeter that I feel are better suited for things like pies or where you do want a sweeter flavor. But for this one, I'm getting a little bit of the sweetness from the allspice. I'm getting a little bit of the sweetness from the coconut milk. And so I didn't want to add another layer of sweetness. So all I did is avoid that, but butternut squash works great in this. You can definitely do it with like your standard like Halloween pumpkin. But there's certain kinds of squash that I think are a little sweeter than I prefer. I think the butternut works so well because it's such a nice like meaty squash and it does have this really good balance. It has a little bit of sweetness but not too much and so it's got some really great character with it but it also has such a great color. I'm really excited to see when you get to the point where you use the infusion blender on the soup and we get to see the color that everything becomes yeah. when you've mixed it up. Almost there. So I've just added a little bit of salt. Now you'll recognize that I waited until now to add the salt, um, partly because there's a little bit of salt in the seasonings themselves. So in the curry powder blend that I have, there's some salt. In the jerk mix, there's salt. In um, the all, I don't think there's any salt in the specific version of allspice I have, but I don't want it to get too salty, like I said before. So I'm kind of waiting until now to add it. And this is already actually simmering. So all I was waiting for is, let me point you down here again. So I was just waiting for once I add, I'm gonna move that out of the way. Um, once I add the roasted, butternut squash that it's not that it still comes back up to a simmer so the temperature is back up so now that that's there that was a very fun job of fishing out all the things that you do not <laughs> want in here so some of this here's some time I feel bad just wasting this but so hopefully um, it's imparted enough of its flavor that it's done its job okay have you ever this is where I like to keep count of how many of these things I've added have you ever um before for your herbs in like and things like this have you ever made yourself like a sachet to put in to make it a little bit easier or use like a larger like tea infusion ball or something so you can just dump it in pull it right that out. sounds very cool I have never done that but it sounds great because then you're right. It give, puts the flavor in and then you're not stuck kind of taking things out individually. Yeah, because they, uh, the, they make tea infusion balls that are like a good hearty size so that you can kind of use it with your, your herbs and such. Oh. Or if you have like cheesecloth and, cheesecloth and butcher's twine, that's something you could easily throw together too and then just fish it right out, back out again. Well, I had no idea you could put like the tea balls mm -hmm. in this. But, okay, let's check. I'm pretty sure there's some more time in here. Aha. So this actually happens a lot in Indian food where there's a lot of different kinds of Indian food that I like, but a lot of them have like cardamom and cloves and those mm -hmm. things. And my worst nightmare is biting into one of those things, you know, so like when my mom makes it, for example, or my aunts make it, I'll be like, please, I do not want to bite into that. And they'll be like, no, no, there's just one in there. And I always end up being the one that ends up with it because you have to take it out beforehand and it gives a good flavor, but you don't want to bite into it. Okay, I think. Uh, we had actually someone brought in a question about the sachet I was talking about. So with using cheesecloth in order to make a little sachet to drop your, um, your herbs in, that's not something that you're going to necessarily reuse. It's more of a disposable situation with cheesecloth. That's more of, its design is more like that. It's, um, cheesecloth is something that's used a lot more in like staining processes and things and such. So it's not really something that you reuse and rewash. It's kind of designed to be permeous and it falls apart very easily. So it would not be something that you reuse over and over. You kind of get it in like a little roll and everything. So you can just snip off oh. what you use, tie it with just tie and everything. And then once you're done with that sachet, it's pretty much sachet away. So 
Is is just like I'm sure they've thought of this. Is it also made in a way where like no part of it is disintegrating into your food? So you're not like I mean it's it's just it's just like cotton. So it's nothing that's really going to be any kind of a major issue. Maybe you get a couple little fibers that you're never going to notice or anything like okay. that because you're probably doing that already when you're putting your napkin to your lips and such. Mm, okay. All right. I'm just we're ready to puree this. So I'm going to turn off the heat. I'm going to grab my immersion blender and then we're just going to puree and then we're going to plate and then we're done. Awesome. Okay. Be right back. I'm excited. So if any of you are not familiar with um, an immersion blender, it is a handheld stick blender that you can put, thus immersion, put right into any kind of a sauce or soup or anything like that. Uh, here's a recommendation. You can get sachet spice bags from Target. Oh. Always use those. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? They, they, there's also... um. There's like disposable like tea sachet bags too, but uh, like the metal, the metal like big tea infuser ones that you can use all the time. You can squeeze all your spices into it and everything like that. So that's that's definitely if you if you cook in this way a lot, that's something to consider as an investment. Okay, we're ready to puree this thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems kind of unfair that. I take you guys through this whole thing and you're all- And then patient. we don't get to eat any. I know, and then you don't get to taste it. You well, don't you get to smell it. <laughs> yeah, but you don't get to have that like errant bay leaf get stuck in your mouth. I don't feel it's fair. <laughs> it's okay. like when John does all the cocktails on Thursdays and then he drinks it in front of us, so. Yeah. Okay, so I think we've had this blender for like many, many years. I'm using this now. Full disclosure, I might put this in the Vitamix later if I feel like it's not creamy enough for my taste, but for now, just because it's more powerful, but I'm gonna try it with this now, which we usually use for things like shakes and things like that, okay? I will say as I take a break that if you do want this to be a little chunkier, you don't want it to be a total puree. You want to um, have the texture of some of the carrot and the celery and the onion and things like that. You don't have to blitz it all the way. I just mm -hmm. am going to try to make this into a complete puree, but you'll see as I do it, it gets thicker. Ah, yes, the stove is off. Yeah. <laughs> stove is off. <laughs> Yeah, you want to make sure there's no heat when you're using the immersion blender. Yes. But that's why I also sometimes like to let this cool a little bit before doing it just because of splatter. But again, this is one of the benefits of this being a huge pot, I guess. And as you blend it, you can really smell it even more. And let me show you what I was talking about with the... Um, butternut squash peels, right? So right now there's no butternut squash peels in there, mm -hmm. uh, but there are like onions and other things that are softened. So you could see, see these little bits that are just stuck to that. If I had butternut squash peel in there and I've done this before, it just all gets caught in that. And you can tell that it hasn't softened to mm -hmm. the extent that um, the rest of it has softened. So. <laughs> And you can, see how, you can see how she's kind of like working around the pot and everything too. You don't want to hold the immersion blender in one space. You want to, yes, yes, it's to avoid, you want to make sure that there's room in the pot to avoid splatter um, and then move, definitely move around in the pot to make sure you're getting all of your different bits and everything like that. We actually have um, an immersion blender at Kendall that is mm -hmm. like the size of a jackhammer. What? That is used for like making, doing very, very large oh. um, blends and things like that too, so. Okay, it's pretty thick. This is the stage at which you can, oh, 
I should unplug this. If you want to thin this out, right? So I've pureed it. If you want to thin this out, you can thin it out with a little bit of water. You can always do that. You can thin it out with a little milk if you like. But since I have some coconut milk left over, I'm just gonna thin it out with that. Um, and it'll add a little more flavor. It's not gonna water it down, so to speak, because it's what I'm adding and there's just a little bit of this left. Mm -hmm. So add that in. And again, remember that if you're eating the soup the next day and you don't want it as thick, you can always add a little water to water it down at that point. Because remember, at that stage, the flavors are a little more intensified. And um, I'm not as worried about the flavor tasting different at that point. One other thing I will say, this is just about done, guys. All we have to do is add, this is my favorite part, add the leftover butternut squash back in. And so you have the texture of the squash as well as the flavor of the squash. But one thing I'm not doing today, um, but that you can do, which really helps at the end of not just soups, but any kind of dish where it's super savory or heavy, is to add a little bit of acid. So the acid that would go well here is lime. Um, lime I used to use lemon-lime interchangeably and it's not gonna make it taste bad, it's still gonna make it taste good, but lime in particular with this soup works extremely well. So if you even to this size, this amount, if you even add about um, the juice of like quarter of a lime uh, and then taste it, what it does is it really brightens up all the flavors. It makes the soup not taste super heavy and weighted down and brings some nice brightness to the soup. So I, I wanna make a lime in the coconut joke here, but I, I'm having trouble yeah. putting it together. So. <laughs> but I, I know you're in 10 though. It's a good one. Good timing, good timing for the joke. Okay guys, last step. I'm gonna turn this off again. And add the remaining. There's probably a prettier way to do this, but okay, we're gonna scrape this off. You know what the best thing is? Like I've been, I've been cooking like this and posting food photos and stuff for like nine, ten years now. All as a hobby until recently. And after I make a soup, like everyone will be like waiting to eat it. And I'll be like, don't touch anything, don't touch it. Because then I have to put one bowl out that just looks perfect that looks yeah. like I just went to six different culinary schools and like one after the other and that I just have all these Michelin stars I put that picture and then the version I actually eat kind of looks like baby food I mean it tastes great but it's not like the Instagram worthy shot if you know what I mean oh I'm fully aware of that myself <laughs> Okay, all I'm doing is adding this up. And just look, guys, like even adding this, how good it looks. Was there a question? Yeah, someone's already planning on their garnishes and was asking if they could garnish it with pumpkin seed. Oh, you could. You know, I have a thing about seeds, um, like pumpkin seed and sunflower seed and stuff. Like they just get caught in my teeth. And, but yes, you could add that. It would add a nice like textural element. Yeah, something crunchy, exactly. Um, with this in the past, what have I done? I've like garnished with a little bit of coconut oil, just for, or coconut oil, coconut milk just for some color. I put a little bit of um, red pepper flakes for color or paprika at the very end, although that's not really a flavor that's in here. So you may not want to yeah. mess with it here. Um, just like green onion, uh, dried thyme, you could put at the top. Um, but again, remember you just need a little, look at this, guys. Doesn't that look like edible? I would say so. Absolutely. I, I, I like that you've like added in, you saved half the butternut squash to like give yep. that texture. Mm -hmm. And at the end, so. Yeah, so that is it. That's the soup. I'm probably going to let this not be as hot, like cool down a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Before putting the bowl, you can see it's still bubbling in places. But what I would probably do at the very end here is, let me grab some of this time. So remember we used, this is another thing I like to do is when I'm using an ingredient, I like to use um, different uh, versions of that ingredient. What's, what's the word? Um, different forms of that ingredient. So mm -hmm. an example is here I used fresh thyme 
in the soup itself. But then at the very end, when I garnish, I'll do it with dried thyme. Um, sometimes I've made things like I've made like a cake before. I'm not a baker. I, I really am not. But sometimes I'll add like coconut flakes to something. And then instead of adding cream or milk, I'll add coconut milk. So what that does is it makes you kind of wonder, what is that other ingredient in there? And the nice thing is it's just coconut, coconut, but it's in different forms. So the flavors that you get from each of them are pretty different because of the way they're processed, because of the way they cook, because of the texture that they lend to the dish. So last thing I'm gonna do here, not too much, just a little bit of dried thyme that I'm just gonna, I always see chefs do this on TV and I'm like, wakes it up. like it makes a difference. So just some thyme in there, wakes it in bite. and it's ready. Awesome. So I hope I'm on time. I hope I didn't go. No, over. we're great. We're great. Don't ever worry about the time. So, um, <laughs> fantastic. So we already talked about some of the garnish ideas for it. Um, is this a good, is this a good hearty soup where you would have it? Would you have it as the main part of your, your meal or is it better as like a starter for a meal? I have had this for lunch with some garlic bread or mm -hmm. some, uh, just dipping it in there. Um, it is good on the side. It is pretty heavy, I would say, because it does have all these vegetables and it has the right. coconut white filling. But if you were to have a smaller portion of it, for example, something like this, which is six ounces is this bowl. If you were to have like a little soup like this and then follow it up with something, um, follow it up with a salad, follow it up with an entree, you could definitely do it. But I would say if you're going to have a big bowl of this, it's going to be quite filling. All right. Well, thank you so much. Again, I wish we had smell a vision because I'm dying to know what it smells like. Well, Christine, you're in town, so I would love to bring you a bowl tomorrow if you're home. Oh my God. I don't know. That sounds amazing. <laughs> um, no, seriously. And uh, does anyone have any questions? Oh, thank you for for enjoying the presentation. I'm so happy that you guys are all here. If you, if anyone has any additional questions before we wrap everything up for today? No, this was fantastic. <laughs> Everyone's dying to have a taste right now, so. No, yay. Oh, thank you guys. Yeah, I'm hearing from some of my family who I think are probably shocked that I'm like cooking these days because until about 10 years ago, I did zero cooking, you know, so. <laughs> To be here talking about like textures and like types of milk is, is probably brand new. <laughs> well, yeah. Saruthi, thank you so much. Christine. Always, this was a joy. It looks delicious. And I know there were some people who had requested the recipe earlier, but I didn't see them join us tonight. So I hope that they're either out there watching this on YouTube right now or are going to be making the recipe on their own. And okay. Let me know, folks, how your recipes turn out, and if anyone has any requests on topics or anything at all, be it culinary, be it beverage, be it hospitality topics, anything. We would love to get your ideas because we are going to be continuing the Taste Talks through November and December, even though our college classes will be wrapping up at the end of this month. Just because the academic courses stop doesn't mean education stops here at Kendall. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you guys. Everyone have a fantastic weekend. Enjoy the weather out there. Can't wait. Bye guys. Bye. Bye.